Uh, give me some beef Wellington tips. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm Keith. I am the executive food editor at Cook's Illustrated Magazine, and I am here with Ashley. That's Hi, Ashley. right, Keith. Hi, Keith. Um, I'm Ashley. I'm a food stylist here at America's Test Kitchen. And we are here to answer all of your burning culinary questions today. So, uh, first one up. Yeah. You, you want a hard one or an easy one? Oh, boy, Keith. Hard one. Of course. A hard one, okay. Slash easy. Is active dry yeast oh. good past the listed expiration date? Keith, I would say no. You would say no? Yeah, what good. do you say? Okay, no. Did I pass? I, I, I think that's oh, a stressful. kind of, this isn't a pass fail type of thing. It sort of is though. I'd say, <laughs> I'd say there's a little wiggle room there. There is. But I would definitely go with the expiration date Within yeah. a couple weeks? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, it's not like the expiration date comes and the yeast all dies and you can't use it anymore. It, it, it kind of probably drops off and right. the longer af after the expiration date, um, the, the worse it would be. But um, yeah, if it's a week or two after the expiration date, go for it. If it's a month or two months, then I would probably ditch it and buy some new stuff. And don't call Keith if your bread doesn't rise well. Yeah, don't, <laughs> I have nothing to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will pick a, another question. What are you thinking? Are you feeling really confident, sort of confident, not confident at all? Uh, uh, let's go with uh, the middle ground. It's, it's still early. Sort of confident. <laughs> sort of confident. All right. All right, I'll give you that. This is a good one. Easy, Easy peasy. You say that. Okay, but. this is from Jilla188. Why does my all butter crust shrink when par baked even after letting it rest 30 minutes? Oh, wow. I mean, so shrinking in pie crust is going to have to do with gluten development. So um, handle it a little bit more gently. Um, uh, you know, when you're rolling it out, don't, don't manhandle it. Freezing it for a longer period of time before you put it in the oven uh, to help that gluten relax uh, before it goes in is probably uh, uh, something that you want to do if you're having problems with your pie crust. Um, you know, if you're blind baking it, making mm -hmm. sure that you are leaving uh, the pie weights in so it doesn't have an opportunity to shrink while it's baking. Um, those are yeah. some of the ones off the top of my head. You. you have more? You passed. Um, I also was going to say um, perhaps the temperature of your butter could yep. have been too warm. You want to make sure the butter is very, very cold. You want to cut it first and then chill it in the refrigerator, um, probably at least. 30 minutes, you don't want yep. it to be room temperature. And then the other thought I had was um, similar to your response. Um, once you do put the disc into the refrigerator mm -hmm. to um, hang out, you wanna make sure that you do put that in for the a long enough time to allow that gluten to relax at that stage too. Sometimes people rush that or they think it's not necessary. Um, to once you've kind of you know gotten the mixture together, you put it into the disc in plastic wrap, put it in the refrigerator. It, it, don't skip that step. Is really yeah, what I mean say. time. If you have the time to let your dough relax as much as possible in between the steps of like rolling it and forming it, putting it into the pan, that that's the best bet. Yeah. Great. Okay. Okay. Oh, Another question for Ashley here. Mm. Here here's a good one. Okay. Is there a correct knife to use to cut onions? Well, I mean, sort, yes. They're all, they the all The correct could... answer is a sharp knife. Yes, thank you. No, no, you're no, good, no. you're good. I mean, I was gonna say, I'm trying to think of a knife that would really be difficult to, I mean, maybe a cleaver, but I've seen people here in the test kitchen use a cleaver. Yeah. Um, but yeah, sharp knife for sure. Um, sharp knife in general will make your life a lot easier in the kitchen. Um, you could use a chef's knife, you could, Use a boning knife if you're pretty skilled with a knife. A uh, paring knife is probably too small because um, we assume, you know, one onion here is a medium sized onion, which usually weighs about eight ounces. And once it's chopped, it equals about one cup. So that's kind of a good measure. Yeah. So if you were an introductory cook, you would probably recommend a chef's knife, maybe? Yeah, chef's I mean, knife. That, that would give you a, a nice long cutting surface to kind of get through that onion. Yeah. But if you're more skilled, uh, yeah, you could probably get a cleaver. Like you said, people in the kitchen here cut it with mm -hmm. cleavers, a uh, boning knife. Um, yeah, but a beginner, you probably want a larger Chef's knife there. Knife, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. So, let's see here. Um, 
best method for separating the grease after roasting and slow cooking? Uh, so a fat separator is, is probably the, the easiest thing. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, they, they allow uh, the liquid to fall to the bottom and the grease kind of comes to the top. And there, there are different ways that they use to get that liquid out. I, I think our winning one actually dumps the liquid from the bottom. There's a, a yeah. stopper at the bottom, you press the button and it kind of yeah. falls below. But this is actually the... Um, That's our winning fat separator. Winning fat separator. Wow. It appeared out of nowhere. That is so weird. Like, <laughs> yeah. um, so I, won't, I don't want to block it with my hand, but if you can see that, that red plastic thing, uh, if when Ashley presses up here, it, it picks up that stopper from there and the liquid just comes out from the bottom and leaves the fat on the top. Yeah. It's beautiful. And then if you're mad at Keith, you just... Wow, I don't know. You know what, what I mean? I don't, I don't, I don't know. know what you're gonna do it's with that. Weird. <laughs> I'm gonna put this over yeah, here. Yeah, let's the time just put here. that over there. Um, yeah. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty. Easy. Here, easy question. This easy. is a very easy question. How do you clean enameled Dutch ovens? Okay. So, we've done some testing on this. You could yep. do a few different ways. Um, Trusty friend is hot soapy water. Yeah. Um, or if it's really bad, like really, really bad, we have a solution on the website, cooksillustrated.com, um, where you can do bleach to water. We actually did, um, I forget how many parts it is. I think it's- I think it's three, three to one, three to I think one. is probably a good place to start. Okay. Yep. And we did this really cool test where um, the person on the tastings and testings team um, did half of, I don't know how they lined it. Was it with scotch? I mean, was it with tape? Yeah, or whether they just suspended in a, or just filled it up halfway with, with the bleach water. Yeah, but, yeah. because ha in, on the, if you look on the web, on the bottom of the Dutch oven, half of it you'll see is, you know, quite gray, and the other half is perfectly clean. Yeah. And I may or may not have been looking recently because I may or may not have scorched the bottom of my Dutch oven at home. <laughs> hypothetically speaking. Um, and so I've actually been looking at that lately, yeah. thinking how did they take that photo? But um, anyway, yeah, so it's three to one water to bleach. And, and I don't think it's necessarily bad that, that your Dutch oven is stained. I, right. I know that it's harder to see whether things are browning in there, but it's actually not bad. It won't affect the, the, flavor. the, the flavor or the, the ability mm -hmm. to, to cook or anything like that. So it's, really cosmetic more right. than anything. I mean, you definitely just want to make sure you aren't, that you are getting any chunks or, you know, big brown bits that may have burnt so much, hypothetically yeah. speaking, <laughs> onto the bottom of the Dutch, Dutch oven. Um, yeah. That and must have been a good dinner. Oh, real tasty. <laughs> and it was tomatoes too, so that Ooh, just, yum. you know, um, really, okay. really good. Your turn. All right, my turn. Okay, when it, this is, a softball? Are yeah. You, are you lobbing me one? Yeah, I want you oh, to okay. like go easy on me later, so this uh, okay. is okay. When a baking recipe calls for brown sugar, does it mean light or dark? So with with our recipes at ATK, um, we usually specify whether it's dark or light brown sugar. Uh, if if we don't specify, that would mean that that both are acceptable. Um, I know that a lot more people have light brown sugar than dark brown sugar. Mm -hmm. um, so in general, I think you probably find that it won't make that big of a difference. Um, Only if it's crucial and super important to the recipe, yeah. we will specify. It, in, in, especially if you're using like a lot of it. Um, right. I'm, I'm trying to think of an application right. where you use a ton of brown sugar, maybe in a, brown sugar a, a cookies. cookies. Yeah, that 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 would probably. Um, okay. I think our our perfect chocolate chip cookie, which is a, a great recipe, that calls for dark brown sugar because you want those molassesy or more molassesy mm -hmm. notes. Um, but um, most of the time, either or is fine. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay. Oh, thanks. Okay. That, that was a good one. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. You you wanna uh, give me some beef Wellington tips? No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, you give me some beef Wellington. Okay. Tips. Here's a good one. What are some essential spices to keep on a spice rack? I thought oh. you'd never ask. <laughs> You you prep for this one? I prep okay, for this good. one. Excellent. Okay, well not really. All right. Salt. Two types of salt. You wanna have iodized. Okay. No, sorry, table salt and kosher salt for two different reasons. 
Okay. Um, I keep both at home, mainly the table salt for popcorn, because kosher salt on popcorn isn't the same. However, really? I will give you my ATK response. Table salt is for seasoning everything. Kosher salt is for seasoning on meat, protein. Um, so I do definitely want you to have both those salts. Um, black pepper, or else, black pepper, corns that you will grind, on your, grind own. on your own. Okay. Um, and then I'd say some staples, you know, this could be obviously very personal from person to person. Yep. Um, but I have, um, I do have garlic powder. You never know when you're going to need it. Garlic powder? Yes, don't okay. judge me. No. Um, cumin, chili powder, which has cumin in it. Um, I do have dry mustard powder. And do you have any like really weird spices that, yeah, that you so go I to have, all the time? Okay, I wish I said I did, but I don't. <laughs> I have the ones that have stayed in my spice cabinet for way too long. Yeah. Um, a lot of some dried herbs that I never use because yeah. I'd rather use fresh. Yeah. Well, when it's when it's appropriate. Um, paprika is a good one to have on hand. Yeah. Um, Aleppo powder, um, Aleppo pepper powder, Aleppo pepper. Pepper powder. Picked Say a, that 10 times fast. Pe 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 pickled peppers. <laughs> Peter Piper. Um, what about you? Um, I also do two other salts, not, not two showing other up. So well, you have four different salts? Fleur de sal and Malden. Yeah, so Malden salt is, um, is certainly uh, something nice to have to sprinkle over steaks. Um, do I have any spices that... Um, I feel like you have a lot of spices. I, I have a lot of spices, and, and I feel like I collect spices, but I don't know if I necessarily use them all the time. I feel um, like you do. Oh, curry powder. I curry guess. powder's good. I could um, see you being adventurous with your spices. So I like fennel a lot. Oh. Um, you know, fennel seed. Um, what else? Um, yeah, I... I have a lot of spice. I have a lot of spice blends, you right. know, like Badavan curries and. Um, yeah, I knew you did. Yeah, like dukas, you I know, that kind of spices and nut blends. Yeah. So I, I have a lot of those kind of hanging around. And those um, are good too because they are more bang for your buck and they really are, you know, they change a flavor profile completely and it really gives it a distinct flavor. Yeah, and if you're doing like, you know, if you're cooking for your family or you're doing a lot of kind of weeknight cooking, mm -hmm. spices are always nice. Spice blends are really nice to kind of pick up and just sprinkle it over plain vegetables. So yep. you, you're not really, you're adding interest in your cooking, but, but you're not kind of doing a lot of more extra cooking or a lot of cooking steps. Mm -hmm. So yeah, spice blends are always, Fun to have around. Yeah. yeah. And then what's the shelf life? About a year? Yeah, I think a, a year is, is good. Yeah. I, I, you know, again, you don't have to throw it out right at 365 days. Or call um, you if something goes wrong. Yeah. yeah like well, the yeast. Like the yeast. So. Um, yeah, so a, a year is, is probably a, a good yeah. ballpark. Um, and it's just that the flavor will be more dull, more muted, or muted rather. Um, mm -hmm. It's not like you're going to get sick if you eat no, it. No, it's not spoiled. It just right. it loses its quality over time. Right. Here, here's a here's a good one. Okay. This is from the Fresh Prince of Paleo. How did you get how do you get a job at the test kitchen? Well, um, it's an interesting question because it is a very specific skill set that you yeah. have to have. So if from coming from the cook's perspective, yeah. um, both Keith and I started um, it, on the books team. Yep. Yeah. Um, and at different times his was like 50 years ago. 52, but who's 52 counting? Years. Mine was like... <laughs> <laughs> three days ago. Three days yeah, ago. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, but you have to have, um, by an interesting skill set, I mean, you have to have a cook cooking background. Um, they do prefer that you do have a culinary school yeah. background, um, which gives you that foundation and that knowledge. Um, and then, you know, some creative writing background, um, because here you are cooking, but you are writing at the same time, no matter what team you're on. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's a long process. It took me six months to get in the door here once I first applied. 
through the, it's a long interview process. Yeah, and, and there's, it's a multiple step process. You, you know, there's the normal interviewing, but we ask all the cooks to come in and do a bench test. So uh, they, they come into the kitchen, we give them two recipes from our archives and they cook through that. And then, you know, you are judged by, um, you know, three or four people on, on the team. There's also a, a writing aspect to the, the process is that uh, you are asked to develop a recipe at home on, on your own time and, and write uh, an article about that process. So it's yeah. it, it's it's not easy it, and it does take some time. Um, yeah, and I think um, what's interesting about that is that you are being um, not necessarily judged, but it's, it is a lot about your analytical skills because here we are constantly analyzing and building off of a test we did. How can we make it better? It's a constant, um, team environment where we're being criticized constructively. Um, so you have to have a thick skin and be able to take that kind of um, feedback yeah. well. Um, unlike Keith, I mean, he... What are you talking <laughs> I, about? So you see, you know? Um, but yeah, it, it is an interesting place. And then um, from there, yeah, usually if all things go well, then you get the job. Yeah. So hopefully we'll see you. Yeah. You can always go to the website uh, and see if we are hiring for test cooks. So mm -hmm. that, that's the best place to find out. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Let's see. But we also Let's have an see. internship program if you want to start yes, that way. Which, is, which you can also find out on the website, too. Yeah. They start every three months. Yeah, I think that sounds yeah. right. OK. So how do you select LA Jake 209 asks, how do you select the models to test out? Do you pay for the items or are they donated? Okay, so I think they are referring to equipment, equipment. Not, not recipes. Yes. Um, so I, I don't, I mean, a lot of it is, is seeing what's out there on the market, um, you know, what's popular uh, with people. So the, the tastings and testings team, they'll go to a lot of, of um, I don't want to say job fairs, but shows. The, the shows, yeah, yeah, equipment shows, uh, you know, around the country to see what's new, what's coming out. Um, they'll, they'll ask people, they'll survey our readers, you know, wh what are you using in the kitchen? Um, and, and then kind of go from there. Um, we, we buy all of all the equipment that we test here, um, you know, to, to kind of remain you know, unbiased. Not unbiased. Uh, so, so we purchase all that stuff. Um, yeah, but um, in fact, if somebody sell, uh, if somebody sends something to us or to the tastings and testings it's team, it's blown up. It gets blown up. <laughs> we have a whole <laughs> closet of dynamite and uh, kerosene and matches, and we just blow it up. <laughs> um, no, but we have to donate it because we just we that just wouldn't fit yeah. our um, business model or our brand. We'd be biased. Yeah. So, so, yeah. And there's a lot of input from the cooks as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you have a lot of cooks using a lot of different equipment here that they'll say, hey, you know, maybe we should test, you know, garlic presses or, you know, rim yeah. baking sheets or something like that. Yeah. So. And, um, you know, sometimes things are super outdated. For instance, if we haven't done nonstick skillets in a long time, they'll redo them. Um, you know, now we don't really have Teflon anymore. So I think it was a few years ago that they did the nonstick skillets, but it was a welcome welcomed test to do. Yeah. So, yeah. This is uh, from Farm Girl Shelly in Can You Prepare and Freeze Cookie Dough and How Does This Change the Cooking Time? Well. Well. Yes, you definitely can. Um, so usually what you want to do is um, make the cookies according to the recipe, and then either using an ice cream scoop or tablespoon measure or however it says to do in the recipe, you want to portion them like you normally would. Um, and then once you're all done with that, just making your life easier, you can grab a zipper lock bag and put them all in, transfer most of the portion cookies into a zipper lock bag. And then your first step, when you do put them in the freezer, you might want to put them flat onto um, a rim baking sheet. And that way they all don't kind of compile like my to toddler likes to just put them all kind of together. <laughs> like balls yeah, together. Because yeah. he's helping. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so you want to kind of put them in a single layer into the freezer. And once they are frozen after about like a half hour, or an hour, maybe a little more than that, mm -hmm. um, then you can kind of pick it up and shake it. Um, and then, anyway, so you will keep that in the freezer. And then it doesn't really require too much 
um, tweaking with the recipe. Um, sometimes you do just need to leave the cookies in an additional uh, minute or two, but usually it does bake according to the recipe yeah. we found for the yeah. most part. And I think that that in general this works for right. most right. recipes, right? Yeah. I, I mean, especially drop cookies like, you know, chocolate peanut butter chip. cookies, chocolate chip cookies, sugar. oatmeal cookies, sugar cookies, you know, those kind of quintessential, um, right. you know, lunchbox cookies, I would call them, that it works pretty well. Uh, I mean, there might be some occasions where yeah. you wouldn't want to freeze it. Like but if you have something that has whipped egg whites in it, I think you're running into some dangerous territory. Yeah. Um, or something I'm thinking of like, uh, I don't know. Yeah, like mer anything meringues. like meringues, yeah, something yeah. like that. But but in general, like like icebox cookie where yeah. you roll them. Yeah, um, yeah in it is you know, pretty good general rule to follow that yeah. you can freeze them. Yeah. And it's so good to do, because then you could just pop them in the oven or the toaster oven when you're craving. Do you, you bake your kids like freshly baked cookies every, every morning? morning, noon and night. You're such a good mom. Aw, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Even my four month old, he <laughs> loves them. <laughs> with his alimentum formula. He likes to crush them up with his formula. Yep, he really does. All right. He's a chef. Uh, okay. You wanna you wanna go? Sure. Um, what's the best flaky pie crust? Butter or shortening? From the handle, Linda uh, five three three. She said Crisco, but I'm, I changed it to shortening. Shortening. That that's a that's a really good question. Um, I mean, both fats will will perform well and, and give you a, a flaky crust. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, um, all butter is is going to be more flavorful. Um, you know, I know that that um, people you know want that butter flavor and they don't like to use Crisco and a lot of people are don't like those hydrogenated vegetable yeah. oils. I was going to say it's sort of a personal preference. Yeah. Um, I wonder if flakiness, I'd be, I'm sure we've done a side by side before and I'm sure we, it could be answered easily, but I'm, I wonder if butter would be flakier than shortening. Yeah. I, I don't know if, if it's flake. I mean, if you handle them properly, I think you right. can still get flaky results. Uh, I mean, the, the nice thing about vegetable oils or hydrogenated vegetable oils is, is that, um, they have a wider temperature range in which to right. use them and you don't have to worry about them melting mm -hmm. um, like with butter. So the, I think they're a little bit more forgiving in, in a pie crust. Um, yeah, I think also maybe technique wise would be one way you wouldn't use shortening. Like if you are, if the recipe calls to great frozen butter. Yes, which which is, uh, we have an all butter pie crust that grates the butter into the flour, which is really probably impossible to do with, with, just with sounds Crisco. gross. It does kind of sound <laughs> gross. Yeah, 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 it does. No offense. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah, it's a good one. Yeah. Okay, here is the question that I've wanted answered all day. What underwear does Gordon Ramsay wear? This is by Chucky Boy 17. He, he always wants asks it. these kinds of questions. <laughs> does Chucky. he ask this every time? Every time. Every time. He DMs me every day. No, he doesn't. Chucky. Ch Chucky. <laughs> he is just. Chuck Why are you avoiding Chuck the question? I'm just talking about Chucky. He's making me chuckle. Uh, Gordon Ramsay wears steel undies. <laughs> I'm going to go steel, on the record and steel say steel undies. undies. What? Because nothing's getting through. Gordon Ramsay's. Uh, yes. To wear. Yeah. Okay. Nothing's coming in and nothing's going out. Okay. All right. What do you think? I I I can't beat the, the iron on two. <laughs> no steel. Steel. You, you can beat it with iron. I don't know. That's above my mental okay. pay grade. <laughs> what uh, do you think? I, I'll go with steel. Oh. Yeah. Okay. You really think you wear steel undies? Uh, uh, no. Okay. Gordon. If you're out there, tweet us. Tweet us. No. Get back to us. Yeah, just email us. Or you can tweet it if you want. Yeah. That's on you. <laughs> okay? That is your choice. And Chucky, if you know the answer, 
get back to you us. You let us know too. <laughs> so that's right. it. Thank you for being with us today. If you have uh, more questions, we'll have more opportunities for you to ask them. And hopefully we can get to all your questions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.